is where you get to ask whatever questions uh, cross your mind. We've got a, uh, a pretty good panel here. We've been paneling together now for years, and uh, we pretty much uh, have seen many, many, many of the questions, uh, but there's always new ones. Uh, so we have a, a very, very broad, broad capability to answer questions as they come up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I've tried to get everybody to kind of move over here. Uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. If it's on the appropriate, uh, right now, if it's appropriate to the question that's currently been asked, then just give me both hands. Uh, and for the sake of the panelists, uh, and you should understand that they do respond very well if you buy them a drink. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk for a minute. Truly. Uh, we've been on panels I prefer before, cash. and in the middle of the panel, people have come up with beers. I mean, it's uh, one of those kinds of things. So, uh, but there will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we've got a one-hour session. At the end of the hour, there's nobody behind us. So we'll have plenty of opportunity to get the questions, make sure we got them all covered. Um, in all cases, um, we do consulting and services and things like that. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about things that might be useful. Uh, if you have business cards, uh, if, I don't know if we're going to get a lot of people lined up up here, but if you have questions, go ahead and put your questions on a business card. Uh, things like that, we'll be able to get back to you. Uh, the email addresses that are on the first slide are going to be presented again at the end. So if you want to email folks, uh, follow-up questions, you said this, what about that? Uh, we'll be glad to be able to get to all of them. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. What we're going to do is I'm going to have all of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'll go first. My name is Bruce Clay. Uh, for those of you who have been in SEO for a while, uh, I've been around since 1996 doing search engine optimization. Uh, we focus on white hat, uh, which really allows us to cater to <laughs> large customers. Uh, the panel uh, generally chuckles when I say that uh, because they because uh, so I've been around since stuff. 1996, too, and I know. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's what I do. I have tools. I have training. I do services. Uh, we have clients big and small, everything from eBay and uh, Turner Broadcasting, CNN, uh, little guys. So we do everything. Um, start here with Todd. Uh, my name is Todd Friesen. I'm the director of SEO at Performix. I uh, formally started out in this business about 11 years ago on that side of the microphone as an affiliate. Sold a lot of Viagra, a lot of Phenermine, a lot of diet plans, model cars, you name it. We sold it back then and now i am reformed my ways. I'm pure as the driven snow. I do SEO for a large agency that we have bigger clients than he does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say after that. Uh, my name is Greg Bozer. I'm a SVP of search services for Blue Glass Interactive. We're also a large agency with big clients, and I've also done a lot of, uh, you know, aggressive affiliate stuff in my day, and um, so kind of same kind of stuff that Todd's done. And I'm also reformed in Pure as the Driven Snow. No. For those of you that didn't hear when he turned off the microphone, he said aggressive affiliate stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Stephen Spencer. I never had to reform myself. Um, the founder of an agency called Net Concepts. I started in 1995, before all you guys. And um, I, I didn't start doing SEO in 95. I started as a web marketing agency and been doing SEO for you know, over a decade. And um, let's see, so I co-authored a book called The Art of SEO published by O'Reilly. Co-authors include uh, Eric Anga and Rand Fishkin of SEO Moz and Jesse Stricciola. Um, I invented a technology platform, an SEO proxy technology called Gravity Stream, which rocks. And uh, Performix has been reselling since 2004. Thank you, Performix. Um, and uh, let's see, so that's about me in a nutshell. Oh, and I uh, sold Net Concepts. Uh, 12 months ago to Covario. So now I'm off on my own, did my earn up. One of the things that uh, I think would help us from the standpoint of questions is uh, I'd like the panel to spend one minute 
if they could, going down, just saying what they see as the most important item in the next 12 months that would affect SEO and affiliates. We're all just going to say the same thing. I know. Links. <laughs> links. I'll answer for Stefan now. Links. Yeah. Greg. Uh, link filtering and localization. Oh, so you just got fancy with it. I did get fancy with it. <laughs> I.e. links. Those are the two, <laughs> two biggest issues. Okay. We are uh, really open for questions at this point. Um, so, question. We'll start there. That was quick. Speak loud. Okay, um, I'm going to repeat the questions because they're recording them uh, at the back. Um, so you're talking about articles and spinning them off, and is it a problem? Yes, and the submission to using services such as distribute Distribute your articles as a service and others. Um, I'm not a fan of article spinning. Uh, I think, well, I don't like spam, and um, I think that's a low quality link. So it's, it's not, I think, good value for money in terms of your time and effort and the return on it. I, I don't think so. And uh, also, if, well, uh, if you're creating quality content and you're creating multiple versions of that quality content that's rewritten from scratch, that's one thing. If you are uh, just using a, an automated tool for spinning that just submit, uh, just swaps in synonyms and things like that, that's, that's not adding any extra value. So I, I'd say that's kind of risky. You're going to be potentially um, spotted by your competitors and then turned in. There's a Google Webmaster Central you know, spam submit form that uh, your competitors are more than happy to use on you. The, the thing is with most spinners, I mean, you're just basically doing synonym replacing and uh, Google's ability to semantically analyze a page is, is pretty strong. So the idea that simply using a synonym for a, a few words is going to make a difference on whether they can tell that it's near duplicate is probably a stretch in today's environment. So the amount that you have to edit the article to actually have it stand on its own, you end up kind of rewriting it from scratch anyway. And if you're going to do that, you'd be better off uh, paying people to do that for you and submit truly unique versions. I mean, there, there's a reality right now that that does work. In, in enough volume, that does work. You will see ranking increases. I'm not going to I'm not going to pull the wool over your eyes. It does work. But the days, I guarantee you the days are numbered. And I wouldn't be surprised to see all those article sites come under a lot more scrutiny in the new year. Um, you know, exactly like these guys said, where do you think Google's did you mean comes from? They know what you're looking for. They, they can analyze all that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't do it either. And if you are doing it and it is working, don't rely on that because it, it is going to stop working. I guarantee it. I would think that you're actually putting yourself at risk developing a, a profile for yourself, a rap sheet that Google's going to keep. And this infraction may not uh, put you into the penalty box, but this plus three other things that you do over the course of the year could be enough to where they nail you for it. And you don't want to downplay the fact that these sites that your article might end up on link to a lot of low quality sites and ultimately that association will harm you. And so people you scrape those careful. sites and re-spin that article and take your links out of it anyway. So basically you're, you're fueling other spinners a lot and you know the, the, the links that you're going to get in that content it's, it all depends on where that article ends up because you need you know a link in that article hosted on a site that has solid trust and authority is valuable, but the sites that have solid trust and authority aren't borrowing content from easing articles or any of those sites. So, second row. Legitimate, which, as we well know, many, many times they're not. They're in that neighborhood. 
So right. do you use any of those kinds of services, or are you literally just one by one going to sites, manually developing a relationship, or are, are some of these sites legit? You know, text link ads, text uh, link ads. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's not throw out names. Yeah, yeah no names, because they're all friends of ours. And, uh, well, let's let Bruce read yeah, the, the question. The, uh, this is going to be one of the tests, I think, of being a moderator is repeating some of these questions. So <laughs> fundamentally, describe a white hat link approach that is actually going to work. That is scalable. That is scalable. Uh, um, right. Okay. Well, okay. white hat and link building, if you believe Google, those things don't belong in the same sentence, no matter how you slice it. Right? And, and link networks... <laughs> It doesn't mean I agree with them. Stop clapping. <laughs> a lot of those networks are pretty well mapped out at this point. And it, I mean, basically, you're buying links, it's not white hat link building. You're using a network, it's not white hat link building. I don't care how you want to define that. White hat link building is putting something out there that will get links on the merits of what it is you put out there, regardless, right? So something that, without the help of other people, does well on dig or gets passed around on blogs or gets posted somewhere else, uh, uh, content you share, uh, guest posting, those sorts of things are white hat. How well that stuff does is really up to how good you are at promoting it across the different channels. The scalability of that is pretty small because you have to keep putting out unique content and then the manpower behind finding the partnerships and the placement for that content. Yeah, and we do a, you know, the thing is, for us, we do a lot of link building for clients, and we have um, large networks of, of sites that we have a working relationship with that we can get published, the content published on. And, and our thing is, the key is, that all the stuff that we do is always uh, a new link and a new piece of content. So the data discovery is a big thing with Google now. So the problem with some of those networks is, uh, you know, we went through a phase when everybody started figuring out that links in content are more valuable than links in navigation structures. So... Brilliant companies like the one that got mentioned started selling links in old blog posts, right? Inline linking is, was all the rage. And then uh, Google went, you know, I've crawled this page 400 times in the last two years, and there's never been a link, and now all of a sudden there's a new link embedded in this. Um, that's odd. That's not how, that typically doesn't happen in the real world, in their world of what they feel is the proper way. So the key thing is, you know, if invest the time if you're going to, use a content service or whatever and write articles and go find good quality sites and, and do we do a lot of blogger outreach and guest blogging and stuff like that um, because those are kind of links if you're getting you need that article to be published on a blog people actually read right because the whole review me stuff and, and all that kind of stuff you know these are kind of fake sites they have a lot of PR focused at the home page they have no RSS readers nobody actually reads the article uh, Google knows all that, They're, especially when it comes to blogs with pinging and, and feed burner and all that kind of stuff. They know what sites are real sites and what ones aren't, and the juice does not trickle down to those pages the way it used to anymore. So a blog post that gets published needs to gain external links on its own. So if you find that that blog that is the big power blog, you know those those kind of sites, when they click the publish button, they generate hundreds and hundreds of links every post they write. So those are the kind of sites you want to get your your content in, because you're going to get far more value out of that. So a quick example of uh, a link building initiative that's uh, completely white hat. I was really successful. Um, my previous agency, so I came up, I, up with this idea of uh, uh, a contest for a company called OvernightPrints.com. It was uh, and, uh, you know, business cards and letterhead and stationery and so forth uh, printed overnight and then shipped FedEx the next day. So um, the contest we did in, in conjunction with, uh, with Shoe Money, um, he uh, promoted it on his blog. It was designed Jeremy's new business card and you could win business cards for life, which in reality is like peanuts because in the small print it was a thousand dollars, a thousand business cards per year uh, maximum for up to 20 years and so I think I have enough money in my wallet to cover that and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so Jeremy promoted it uh, on his blog and in YouTube 
it got picked up by a bunch of design sites and uh, lo and behold they went from nowhere in Google for business cards to page one and uh, this was back in 2009 that we ran the contest and they're still benefiting from it um, you know many many months later there's like number two or three for business cards in Google and uh, that's just one example but the scalability of those sorts of campaigns all well, it's you kind of have to systematize it so you come up with an approach where every month you, you basically repeat the same process where you come up with whatever number 20 30 different uh, link bait ideas per month and they could be anything from infographics uh, personality tests widgets um, uh, badges awards um, link bait articles top 10 lists you name it right so all the standard sort of link bait and um, uh, you prioritize this list you work with the if you're the consultant you work with the client to figure out what is most um, within their comfort zone because some of the stuff can be pretty edgy <laughs> right so an example would be uh, a, a life insurance site that uh, ran an article on dig 19 things you didn't know about death and it worked really well but it's not like MetLife would run that um, article. It was <laughs> some no-name site, lifeinsure.com, and they, they benefited greatly from it. They were on page one in Google for life insurance for years. They're still number three in, in Bing and Yahoo for life insurance, and they ran this in 2006 or something. So God bless Bing. Yeah. <laughs> Hooray for Bing. Hooray for Bing. Um, so it, it just depends on your comfort level and your, 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 your brand guidelines and so forth, what you're willing to tolerate. The, the risk, riskier you're willing to be, the, the larger your comfort zone, uh, the, the more success you'll get out of this. And so with this prioritized list, you just bang through those, uh, however many you can get through uh, in a month. You have researchers, you can find these guys on Odesk, on uh, you know, freelancer.com, et cetera. And uh, you get different uh, uh, researchers and you do writers because people who are good at researching, like finding the best beers from around the world aren't necessarily the same people who write really compelling content. So you probably have to get different people to do this. And you just kind of systematize it and repeat, rinse and repeat every month. So. One of the things we did is with Blue Glass, we ran a uh, experiment on building some infographics. And what we found is if you repeat the infographic on a regular basis, update it, refresh it, publish it, uh, the first time you do it, so many people see you and so many people link to you and so many people visit you and so many people talk about you. When you do it again, there's some recognition for the name. More and more people will come. And if you do it three to four times, uh, by the time you're doing the fourth one, you're getting quadruple the traffic of the first one for the same amount of effort. So scalability may also be impacted by frequency and repetitiveness of, of your particular project. The, the goal of a lot of this sort of stuff is to become the authority in your space of whatever it is you sell, not just some other website that sells the same thing and offers five different credit card offers or six of this offer or whatever. Become the authority, and that leads you know nicely out of what Bruce just said, where if you're becoming the authority, when you put out that first infographic, you get some traction. When you, now you're moving towards being the authority, you put out the second updated version. Now you're even closer to being the authority because you've been tracking that information. You're obviously deep in your industry, and, and you just keep moving forward and moving forward. As you move forward to becoming the authority, the links come along with that. Yeah, and it's really important that you do not change the URLs as you do this year after year. So for example, CNET, uh, a client of ours, would have this holiday gift buying guide they do every year, and they change the URL. Each year it had a new URL. What a horribly bad idea, right? So you want to maintain that link equity so year after year. So we should get fired year. for that. You, yeah. Um, I think we did it, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, so if you keep a sta stable URL and then archive the content to an old URL, 2009 gift buying guide when the, the new year hits and you're now doing the 2010 holiday gift buying guide, you keep that stable URL that's been accumulating all the links over the course of the time, uh, that's an important distinction. And the, the other key thing I would throw in there too is, is don't be obsessed and focused on exact match, anchor text. And that's the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is that Google's ability to filter on the individual at the query level 
for sites that are too strong. Um, a lot of we have a lot of large clients that did a lot of, you know, more is good, you know, and they just keep pushing, and all of a sudden. Um, they're very authoritative sites, even and they just they don't rank anymore for two or three phrases, and they're the phrases where they got crazy strong with the anchor text, and we're actually seeing a lot of stuff as we go through and analyze all this, where the sites that are ranking oftentimes don't have the word they rank for anymore in the anchor text at all. Sometimes, so the idea that you have to wrap your head around is that Google's ability to apply semantic analysis to links is similar to how they do it to content on the page, and they can now. Um, more accurately map what they feel should be a, a legitimate backlink portfolio. So, uh, and in the real world, if you look at um, sites that aren't aggressively doing SEO, the common thing you'll always see is that the top links in terms of anchor text is always their domain or their brand name, right? And, and when you see sites where that top link is not that, that stands out like a sore thumb. And I can't tell you specifically what the threshold is, uh, but I can tell you when you correct it, the, the cool thing about their new system is that it's very automated. So we, we've seen sites come back in two or three weeks after we've gone through and pulled those links back or changed them to brand links. Um, authority links are more important than anchor text. But brute force is dead and it's dying. And if it hasn't hit you yet, it's going to. I can promise you that. Um, and so if you have an opportunity to get it, and I always say this, like if I have an opportunity to get a link on Yahoo's homepage or CNET, I would not have that link say internet marketing company, it would say blue glass, right? Because the value of that link isn't in the anchor text, it's in the authority that that transfers. And if you focus on that first, then what ends up happening when you become authoritative, all you have to do is actually publish because now SEO for you is more on page, right? So CNET, you know, a lot of these big sites, they can publish a piece of content that might not get any external backlink support and it'll still rank because the domain itself is, is trusted and authoritative. That's a longer process. It takes longer to get there, but if you get stuck in this brute force mentality, you'll forever have to go out and build links to that every single piece of content you publish forever. And you just never get over that hump. It, these links do not have to be topically relevant to you either in order to really benefit you. So for example, uh, I've given uh, talks at Stanford and, and gotten links for that. You know, so now I got links from techbriefings.stanford.edu. Um, sweet. And, yeah, it's pretty sweet. And in fact, you could do the same thing if you've got some really compelling content because they're they're looking for really good speakers and you know just come in and spend an, an hour giving a talk and get some nice links. So. Uh, uh, don't spread that around, by the way. This isn't going on Twitter, I hope, right? Um, <laughs> oh, okay. and divert, divert, yeah, I'm screwed now. You're, uh, you're diversify your link portfolio as well. So, um, you know, this needs to be a natural link portfolio, not one that's overly skewed in any particular direction. If you have way too many authority domains linking to you in one uh, short sweep of time and nothing that's like uh, more. Uh, lower level or bloggy type links along with it that looks a little engineered. So, and have you guys seen that Google has this thing when you do a search? A lot of times down the bottom left hand corner, they'll say it, it's not related searches, but it says try something different. And what we find a lot is that the phrases that they list there are quite often the backlink portfolio of the number one site. So if you go look at the backlinks of the people that are ranking for that term, what you'll see is you'll see these words and these phrases. So. You know, if you're trying to rank for cheap tickets, you better have links that say affordable airfare and things like that. So, uh, I'd spend a lot of time using semantic tools and, and figuring out, you know, when you do that, you guys all know how to do the tilde search on Google? If you put the tilde in front of the word and Google will show and highlight other words that they feel are related and that tool of theirs is dramatically expanding. It used to be just straight synonyms and now it's, um, it, it's really becoming the semantic web to where they're showing words that are, um, completely related but not necessarily a synonym and you want to spend some time looking at that information so when you go out if you're going to forcefully build your backlink portfolio that you you're taking advantage of that okay uh, links are clearly a major part of everybody's concern um, this was a, a very very terse response to that question <laughs> first row
www.netour.com and avoiding any of the backlash that we may find from an SEO perspective. Okay, the question is, you had a TLD, which was .NET, top-level domain .NET, and you purchased the .com, and you're going to be migrating the site to the .com, and you want to make sure you minimize the penalty. Did you already change the Whois information? Did you, uh, um, you didn't do any 301, no, nothing's happened yet? Nothing's happened yet. Okay. Good. So did, and here's another thing, was the site an established site? Before? Okay, here's a very important thing you need to do before you flip the switch on that. Is you need to go look up the backlink portfolio of the site that's there because when you flip that switch, you inherit all those links. And what often happens uh, earlier this year in the fall, we had a client that similar kind of thing and their, their actual company name, but for 10, 15 years, this site sold eco friendly cleaning products, right? and they sold snowboarding gear, right? And so they did the migration, and all of a sudden, they have twice as many backlinks, and their traffic's down 30%, and they're not sure why. And I'm like, well, look at this search. You rank for eco-friendly snowboards, <laughs> right? So you are what those links say you are, and when you double your link count like that, you actually dilute the links that you had for the things that you want to rank for. So you need to go through there, and you find, and their idea was like, well, there's good juice. This is an old site. It's like, yeah, but it's, it doesn't really work that way. So go through, take any query that, or any link that they have and 301 and deflect that away. Like clean that domain up first. Uh, we do, what we do is like we'll 301 those pages to Wikipedia or something, right? So now when Google comes and fetches those later, we don't want credit for those links because they're not really what we do. And we trim and totally prep that domain's backlink portfolio first, then migrate. So why do you 301 instead of 404? Just to get it away quicker, the four, they'll keep fetching the 404s forever and ever. Mm -hmm. They're just idiots yeah. like and, that. And that's a key point that people don't ever think about is you can manage your links on a link level. If you've got a link you don't like, you can, that link doesn't have to resolve to your domain. If that link comes in, you can put it wherever you want it. You can bounce it to. Other than the home page. So yeah. that's tough. The home page has a lot of wacky stuff linking to it. But then sometimes it's going through and if you are a similar related company and it's contacting those sites and getting them to change to something more appropriate. Um, but you can kind of surprise yourself and, and eventually Google figures it out. But you know this particular company did it right before the winter shopping season and, and it was problematic. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I would start building links to the, the way we've done before. If you want to get real tricky, um, the way we've done before is, is we allow Google to continue. We'll put both domains to the same site, um, and we'll allow Google to continue to crawl the old URL while we start building links for the new ones. But when humans land on it, we serve them. So we start getting some natural new link development happening to the new domain. We, get, we want Google to start seeing the new domain first before we crack it open and let them crawl. When we do that, we find that um, the transition is really, really smooth. Yeah. Yeah. You never uh, want to just flip the switch. You want to take some inventory, take some time, and manage that. If, if you reset all the, I mean, if you change the who is information, and, and the name servers, you know, so the, the registrant, you're changing the registrar, you're changing your name servers, you're changing the content on the site, and you're 301-ing all simultaneously, that's a really dumb idea because you're basically sending a very strong signal to Google that the site is under new ownership and uh, could very well be now a, a, a porn site or an affiliate site uh, popping up and therefore they should reset the page rank to zero and Start negate over. Out all the link equity that had been earned over the years. Yep. So change the who is information slowly, change, you know, just take your time. Okay. Right there. How important is it to have the keyword the user is searching for in your URL? All right. The question <laughs> is exact match keywords or at least partial match keywords. How important is it to have the query keyword in the URL? Yeah. Well, that's really it, important now. <laughs> I suppose it depends on if you want to rank on Google or Bing, right? Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's not as important as people think. And the farther away you get away from the domain, the less important it is. So a file name extension versus a directory versus the domain name. Um, the thing with domain names, and you may have well noticed that exact match domain names in the last 18 months do really, really well on Google. 
Uh, my theory behind that is that in that scenario, those that is the, you know how I said that Google's modeling and mapping stuff based on what a portfolio should look like, and your domain and brand name are typically always the strongest ones. So those sites get a pass on that. You can't filter that, right? You can't penalize the site for having too many links pointing to their domain name or their brand name. It messes up the whole process. But those sites only rank for that phrase for the most part. They don't. When you compare them to the other sites in the space, as far as their total breadth of uh, phrases they rank for, it's not even close. So, and Google has told, I mean, they, they are working to correct that. Um, the comment I got was, yeah, we know it's bad and we're, because we're, I'm saying, I'm like, come, come on, this is stupid, right? Because sites are showing up that have no, they, they shouldn't even be in the same ballpark as these sites that are in that space, but that they're getting so much weight on the domain name that they're killing it. Um, but they have, they're dialing that back a lot now. So that's kind of a short-lived strategy, I think. Which I is a, unfortunate because uh, some guys are making a lot of money and they're going to hate you when you keep pushing Matt to I'm not, dial it back. In fact, some guys might have a depends. hit on you if right now. It's a now. space where it's my clients that are getting pushed out. Come on. <laughs> In my particular case, for 10 years, 11 years now, I've owned the domain seotools.com. And um, for a very long time, I did nothing with it other than forward it over to my toolset.com domain. Uh, which was pretty dumb, I think. Um, then I had a bunch of people offer me a lot of money for it. So I figured if it was worth buying, it was worth building. So all I did was put up eight pages of just some free tools, just to let it start aging. Within two weeks, I was number eight for SEO tools in Google. Now, that's the only thing it ranks for, but the exact match uh, I consider to be pretty dominant right now. Well, and type in traffic too, because you have to remember that Google has this thing called a toolbar, and they pretty much can see what real people do. So my, I would not be surprised at all if type in domain, you know, actions with actual users impact how sites rank. If people are directly navigating, because they go, oh, I need SEO tools, seotools.com, and they have a Google toolbar, there's a very good chance that that information is being factored in in some way. Well, and, and this probably doesn't need to be said at this point in the life cycle of search, but I'm going to say it anyways. Don't go for a big hyphenated domain just to jam keywords in it. Hyphens are bad. They actually use hyphenated domains to test their spam algorithms. I asked one time, I was like, I think Inc. to me did that study a while back where they said after the second hyphen that uh, relevancy drops, drops off like 89% or something. So the next question is like, well, why don't you just write a filter that just removes any site with more than two hyphens. Um, and the response I got was, well, we leave them in there so we can see how good when we roll out a tweak, we use the hyphenated domains to see whether or not we're, we did good or not, right? And then if you show up, then they go back to the drawing board and work a little harder to try to make those, because those sites are typically so, um, yeah. well, we, and we all did that, so we're, yeah. we're sorry we broke it. We, yeah. <laughs> Just a real quick add on to what Greg was saying a minute ago about the toolbar. So if you think about, conversely, if uh, Google toolbar users are not coming to a site, but you're getting other signals like uh, uh, link authority type signals, but no toolbar traffic, that looks pretty suspicious, right? So uh, Google's looking for corroboration amongst these, some of these uh, signals, traffic signals, social signals, like whatever, Facebook likes or whatever. So the, those sorts of things may not actually be a signal per se on their own, but they are corroborating the validity of the signals that they're paying attention to uh, and, and counting. Okay, question over here. Uh, it, Let me repeat that one. Okay. All right, so when you look at uh, a portfolio of inbound links and analyze the anchor text that's used to transfer to your site, the question is what percentage of it is exact match on a query or keyword rich? Uh, what percentage is branded, generic words, some distribution? I, I don't think that, I can't really give you a, a, a perfect metric for the web as a whole. I, I can tell you that Typically, 30 to 60% of links 
what we see are in in fall in that category branded versus uh, domains kind of thing um, it's it's very independent of the space so the way that we approach it is we analyze every, all top you know whoever's on page one and we create an average right so we look and say the average brand makeup in this space is 30% or whatever, an X amount, and, and then we try to target and build based on that average. What we find when we do that is um, that usually gets you in the ballpark and gets you competing in the area without potentially you know, raising the flag. So there'll be some sites in there that are stronger that and some are weak, and you kind of come in right in the middle, and that's uh, so far been the best approach. And when you do that, and especially if you're filtered, so if you have gone missing for a term, I would definitely look at that information. What you'll typically find is a big spike where you're... <laughs> We got 20,000 links and, you know, and the other thing is links uh, to linking domain ratio. That's a big thing for me, right? Because that's a clear and simple, easy way to spot site-wide activity and, and site-wide links always indicate collusion, right? Like you, people just don't naturally put a link to you in their footer and run it across 20,000 page. So we never, ever do site-wide stuff ever again. And, and most site-wide stuff, you know, depending on what it is, can be written off as blog rolls and, and all this and that. So, you know, best case scenario is it's out there and it's not helping or harming. But at the same time, you, like Greg says, you do need to be paying attention to stuff, where those site-wide links land and what they're next to in those footers and sidebars. And if you have like uh, several, I mean, we get this all the time, large clients that have dozens of properties that they own. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with linking your network together. Uh, but what they would do is, um, you know, put links in their footers, and that's been a common practice. And the way that we like to restructure that is, you know, take your about page, for example, and one page on each site has an about page that says, hey, we're a member of whatever company network, and here's our sister companies, and do it more like a directory with a paragraph of text, and they specialize in, you know, keyword A, you know, so the links out to that site are within text, and you just have one page like that on every site. It's way less spammy. It's more appropriate for the end user because they can read information about who owns your company and what other kind of things they do. And that one link on that one about page on each of the site is worth far more than the 50 billion footer links that you would get doing it the other way. When, uh, when you're link baiting, what you can, uh, you can just kind of leave the, uh, the, the blogger community and, and Linkerati to use their own anchor text and you get that natural diversity just by happenstance, right? So the, but you want to kind of um, influence that to some degree. So when we did this um, contest with Shoe Money, we didn't call it rebrand Shoe Money contest, right? That would have been really dumb. We called it win business cards for life contest because then people are going to use that anchor text. Most likely they're going to use the the, the contest name or, or some permutation of it in their, their anchor text of their links. So we can influence that way without it being too artificial, you know, because we're not uh, specifically um, dictating which anchor text they use. Okay. Question there. Well, it's not, you're not, there's two things. Number one, in most blog roles, it's not a targeted generic keyword phrase. If you're doing that, that could be problematic, right? Google's never going to penalize you for your ranking for your blog name or your personal name, right? Um, so Jeremy will always rank for shoe money because people put shoe money in, the, right? That's not an issue. Does it have a ton of value? You know, if, if it's a good authoritative site, sure, it's not bad to be on a blog role. But you see guys doing it all the time. It's like, hey, here are my friends, uh, Blue Fuzzy Widgets and Buy Viagra and, uh, you know, Payday Loans, right? It's stuff like that. If you're doing like that, then that's just it's way, guilt by association. Yeah. Well, and, and that leads into how Google Maps link networks. I mean, pick, pick your link network that you're buying into or your link building company, and you go look at where, they, where you're buying into you know, sort of hidden sponsored link sections and stuff. If you stop and think about it for a little bit, you go into the network and you buy a thousand links for Buy Viagra. Somebody else has bought a thousand links for Fuzzy Blue Widgets on 
30 sites, by Viagra lands next to fuzzy blue widgets. On 80 sites, that lands next to milk chocolate candy. On 40 sites, and that that lands, you know, and you, you can correlate all this stuff back to these common sites seem to all be next to each other on a lot of sites together all the time. And that kind of spells link network. But blog roles and brand names and that kind of stuff, you know, Google knows what footer sections are. They know what sidebars are, and they ignore a lot of that stuff to start with. Yeah, no, we do, in our internal tools, when we're looking for link inventory and all that kind of stuff, and we're pulling backlinks, we don't just look at the anchor text of the backlink of, that we're interested in. We also log and look at what other words are in the other links on that page. So we can spot if a backlink's coming from a page that also has terms on it that would fall in that uh, high-risk area. So you don't ever want to be on a page that has a link that says Viagra unless you're selling Viagra, right? It's just bad neighborhood, and it's a very easy way for them to discount total value on those sites. And it is possible to tank uh, competitors' um, uh, link authority by buying uh, dodgy it's, links. It's really possible now with this new filtering stuff, but that's another topic. Yeah. <laughs> What's the question again? Okay, so the question is the registered, uh, visible, who is information, if it's publicly available or you're hiding it or private it, uh, that information doesn't I don't matter. Think so. No, I don't, I don't think it matters, and, and quite frankly, if you think that's the one thing stopping <laughs> Google from connecting all your stuff together, you're sadly mistaken. <laughs> Yeah. They're significantly smarter than and that. And they are a registrar themselves. And, yeah, yeah, they're a registrar. They are a registrar. Yep. No, and, Google and gets can, all that stuff. Sold a single domain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> registrar that never made a nickel off. And, and you can even find out uh, if historically, if your, your actual name was ever associated with that domain, just go to domain tools and look up the historical who is, and you're still there, so. Okay, so the question has to do with the development of widgets and a best practice from an SEO point of view. That, it gets back to that anchor text thing, so I'll tell you a quick little story, a little widget story. Um, there's this, yeah, there was this uh, very smart young kid who worked for a big SEO company, I'm not going to mention, who uh, made all kinds of cool gadgets and, and contests and cool things like that. And they gave away this widget, and he had this dating site, right? And they started giving away the widget. And then the, in the widget, the widget got really popular. And his content was very compelling and cool, right? It was not, but they started putting in, like, online dating. And, and so they started dropping the anchor text in the widgets. So now all of a sudden, they ramp up. They're ranking really well. And then they went, wow, this is kind of cool. Maybe we should, you know, put some other links in there for people or whatever, right? So they got crazy with it. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of every year, I always ask Matt, like, so what's on, what's your focus for this year? And he'll come out, and like, that was like 2009. He's like, 2009 is the year we kill widget spam, right? It's getting out of control. And, and so getting back to that authoritative thing, if they would have just put the name of the website, you know, powered by, um, they probably wouldn't have shot up as quickly for those phrases, but over time, they'd be there now, right? And they, you know, it's a little longer term haul, but those widgets would have, created and built authority. So if you focus on them for that purpose and, and just get rid of the idea of a brute force thing for anchor text, you should be fine, especially if you're putting out good quality stuff that people are going to run, run on their sites. Well, it doesn't hurt. He kind of wrote a tell all about it. Well, yeah, then he did that, too. He wrote a post bragging about it. And that's even <laughs> worse, right? I'll never, ever do that. Never, ever write anything about how good you're doing on Google because <laughs> they don't like being publicly embarrassed. Uh, one other thing about widgets, uh, a lot of these widgets are, are built in Flash, and uh, that's not going to really be uh, fantastic for SEO purposes. Yeah. Um, we talked about this in the last session, and I've actually talked to Bruce's team about it a bunch, but I just could never get over it because I feel like we're kind of talking out both sides of my mouth. But, um, Paid linking works. I mean, it's 
very effective to increase rankings. There's risk associated with it, but we know it's effective. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out solutions to changing the ranks of something using paid links. So, to give a slight bit of history, a couple of years ago, I was uh, in one of the risk seminars and I said, look, I'm doing paid linking for my top phrase, and it's taking me to page one. And it's bringing in so much revenue that we need to continue doing it. And he said, well, it's a risk, but you're right, it is effective. And so we just kind of left it at that. He didn't agree with it. Um, well, about a year after that, we got slapped with a penalty on that phrase. Uh, we went from number three on average to page 50 uh, for that phrase. And, um, but not other phrases. What you say? But not other phrases, right? Not other phrases, just one phrase. And so um, what I'm kind of getting to is, so we got it resolved very quickly. Um, I talked to Matt, Bruce talked to Matt, they went in. You said you're sorry, you fell on your sword. Sorry, yeah. And you know what? We don't do any paid linking now. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you want to count the Yahoo directory and business.com. We're not doing any you know, paid linking um, outside of that. But I really struggle with this, uh, what uh, Stefan was just talking about. You know, I'm in an industry that's, there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm not VC funded. Right. So I'm doing it on my own dime, and everybody else is doing it on $55 million of Sequoia Capital. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why don't I just go out and take, you know, t shirt phrase of my choice and just blast them with paper post blogs and everything else? I'm willing to spend the money to Tank them. get these guys off these phrases. Well, here's the cool thing about that. <laughs> Is and I, I totally agree that the, the biggest issue has always been with the paid linking and focusing on whether money's changed hand that's been unscalable for Google is that uh, they can't catch everybody and I've never been a fan of ratting on your competitors they don't do it except if we're at a client and they have been doing paid links and they get caught and everybody else in the space is doing it too then we respectfully request that they take the time to look at this whole space because now they put us in an unfair competitive advantage like we can't you just can't do that. You can't take out one and not everybody because, and my thing to clients has always been, if that's working, that's fine, but at the same time, we need to work on all other stuff because when they do come in with the flamethrower and torch the whole space, the site that ends up coming out of the cloud of smoke is the one that uh, wasn't relying on just that, was doing the other stuff as well. Um, so you always got to do both. But now with this new filtering, it's, it's actually a less punitive system than it has been in the past. I don't think they really care whether the link is paid anymore, right? Because now they're just looking at um, volume of anchor text. And, and, and what's really interesting about it, too, is they're no longer scolding the whole entire site. So uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot now that's, that's very intriguing to me is that you know, we have a, a client in a very large, and they're very old site, very authoritative, and they went missing for their main phrase. And before they were client with us, I looked, it's like they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff, a lot of links. But they still rank, they still dominate the space in all the other related terms. But the money term that the boss has said, we need it, that converts the best, they don't rank for that. But what Google does now with their localization filtering on that search result page in some cities where they used to rank for the term that they bought the links for, Google now shows a page from their site that talks about that city in its place. So it's almost like they're saying, Got this really great site. We really want to show it to you, but they've been bad for this one term. So here's Plan B. We're going to give you a secondary choice, and it's not as good as a search result. But they're, so they're not penalizing the whole domain. They're not making judgments on it. It's it's completely algorithmic, and it's it gets them to the point where they don't really care whether you, all those links came because you paid for them or not. The fact is, they're too many, and you're you're going to get dinged for it. But once you fix it, it comes right back. Like you don't have to file a report. You don't got to say you're sorry. You just clean it up, and in a month or so or whatever, it'll typically come back once you get it. Well, and that's the, that's the thing. We didn't actually clean anything up. It's, it's kind of like we just, you know, obviously Bruce Clay has a great reputation. I know that played a part in getting it removed. But, you know, once the thing was removed, the penalty was removed, we're right back up where we were. Now, I do have kind of my own theory, and I don't know if you guys think this holds any water, but we've done public relations work with really you know, good firms. And when you have a good PR firm, 
you know, they are submitting to wires, but the, the real work that goes with PR is you got the connections to the right people. In the yep. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're telling us, hey, I want to let you know part of our SEO strategy is we're submitting you to all these great places. You're on CNET, you're on this and that. And you are. Oh. You're buried in the site, but we were getting thousands of links that did absolutely zero for us. So yeah. my, my main theory is that most of the time, lots of links from places that aren't really all that valuable pretty much just amounts to zero. Yeah, they're like just that? they're just discounted, right? They, they don't have value. I mean, yeah. my thing is, I don't think uh, I think there should be a law that PR people shouldn't even be able to say the word SEO. That's just <laughs> yeah. my personal. Well, and, I mean, and the other thing you have going for you in a situation where you were penalized, or at least on a, on a per link basis, is as you keep moving forward, building links and building links and you know doing things properly, eventually you hit a dilution point again where that that automatic filter goes away. I mean, th th those per query, per keyword penalties aren't done by hand. They're done algorithmically, and there's That's thresholds. The time of search. Yeah. yeah, and there's thresholds to all that kind of stuff. So as you keep going, you can dig yourself out of some of those holes by adding more valuable links on top of it. And see, the upside of paid links is that when you do get in trouble, they're a lot easier to remove, right? Yeah. If you get a large volume like that some other way, you can't always take them back. And so that's a situation where that's a little longer haul, but that's when we, you know, we switch clients to full-on brand and, and domain linking strategies only. And we just try to get that number back in, because it's not the total volume links, it's, I think it's a ratio kind of thing. Yeah. So you, you can dig your way out of it like that. It just well, takes and and that's a situation too where you can start bouncing links away, you know, 301 ing them over to Wikipedia or that sort of thing. Just uh, a bit of inside information on how uh, Google works with these penalties is there are manual and algorithmic penalties and the manual penalties uh, Matt Cutts and his team and so forth have visibility into, but the algorithmic Ooh. penalties they actually can't see. Mm -hmm. It's pretty it just happens. So yeah. they can't actually say that, oh yeah, you are being penalized right now if it's not a manual penalty, if it's an algorithmic one, th they it's don't just, know. It just happens. Is it fair to assume though that if it's just one specific phrase that it was a manual penalty? No. No, I wouldn't no, assume. More likely it's algorithmic. And that's the thing, because see one the... One specific phrase is probably algorithmic. If, if it was a manual penalty, those those guys like to swing a big hammer. And if you, you're, you're not going to be generally not manually penalized. Like if for your whole site's price. showing up at 50, but you still have site links, see, they think that's funny, right? <laughs> so like, hey, you're authoritative, but now you're at 50, but you got the full-blown site link listing and stuff. That's just being <laughs> jerks. But that's, that's when you know, you know, that's a full-blown. But I think the days of that being done is, is coming to an end. I, I, it's just not scalable for them. And this system really works way better. They don't got to pass moral judgment. It just happens. And uh, you know, the, we have this client that sold some products that are very popular in the month of October. And they went, and they're the big dominant site, and they went missing for those, that key phrase. And uh, they had gone out and through their sister sites, and the footer had put that phrase. Um, and I started working with them right when I came on Blue Glass in October. Um, I, First thing we did is I said, hey, call those guys up and just switch it to your domain name. We didn't even take the links down. We just changed the anchor text. Um, by PubCon, of course, after that particular holiday, they were back. <laughs> it cost them millions of dollars, but they were back. And we didn't have to call anybody and say we were sorry. One prominent uh, Googler told me that uh, they don't like to play whack-a-mole. So that's a really good way of thinking about it in terms of manual review or manual penalties. Uh, it's not, you know, as Greg said, it's not scalable for them, not in a way that, you know, they'd prefer to write an algorithm that figures out uh, how to just wipe out a whole swath of these guys. Now, this filtering thing is based on what, so it usually starts with a manual penalty, and then they go back and try to figure out how to do it algorithmically. So around 2008, I don't know if you guys are in the ticket broker space or anything like that, but this is when they really first stepped out on this slippery slope of actually penalizing the advertiser that bought the link as opposed to, it used to be they just tried to devalue, find the sites and make that juice not pass, but that's really hard to not scalable. And so um, it was before March Madness and several of the top ticket companies had gone out and they'd all been chasing each other and buying links on blogs and, and all of a sudden they, went van they all vanished for any, any term that was in the anchor text of any of those links. The rest of the site ranked fine. That was a manual thing, but that process is what ultimately 
with caffeine and that whole thing turned into this automated system, I think. Okay, there's a question there that's been there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Can you million? recommend a strategy for a two million page just, just large site? Like just real a pages. SEO strategy. Have real, real pages. pages. Good content. Really. Wow. Cool. Good for you. I think we found the only two million page site on the net with real content. <laughs> um, How is the site doing now? I mean, like, what's your issues? It's like we're doing so good, I don't even know where to start. So like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But do you, are they bringing you traffic? So the first thing we want to look at is uh, volume is not what it used to be. Yeah. So back in our day, <laughs> earlier volume days, we used to do... Volume was great. We, I, we used to have a separate company that ran this uh, kind of like an internal indexing tool that we would crawl client site and we would power their search results and then we'd spit out related searches and we'd generate you know, an extra 200,000 pages and they'd get a crap load of traffic and we'd drop our affiliate cookie on it. And it was great. This is awesome. Um, and that's the whole thing, blown out a database so you can generate a ton of, and that was the idea is that the more you have indexed, the more traffic you're going to get. It's not really the case anymore. It's that, more that about. That was back when internal linking was awesome. Yeah. You know, we, we had a client that for some reason Google thought they had four and a half million pages and it was great. So we just dropped a text link on the bottom, like in the footer for all the top products and we ranked overnight. Um, but I think where Greg's going is crawl efficiency. Crawl efficiency and, and per database performance. So one of the metrics that we look at a lot is um, what percentage of your pages are producing organic search traffic compared to the number indexed. And if that's way out of whack, then we actually remove pages from it. Like we trim it down, right? So I'd rather you have 100,000 pages where 80,000 of them are generating search referrals than have 2 million pages with that number being that low, right? Because now Google's crawling and wasting their time on stuff that they're never going to show. And so the more efficient you make that crawl and the more that they're crawling stuff that they're going to want to return, overall we find that the site just seems to do a lot better. Uh, piggybacking on that concept, uh, we had in our Gravity Stream tool a non-performing pages report that would show the top non-performing pages that are not uh, they're in Google's index, not driving a single visitor, though, from, uh, from search for that entire month. And then we would uh, prioritize that list. So we sort the list by uh, crawler activity. So the more uh, hits from Googlebot, the higher up in the list it would be. So presumably, if it's getting quite a lot of traffic from Googlebot, it has some equity or has some, uh, you know, there's some importance there in the eyes of Google and should be low-hanging fruit perhaps. It's just uh, uh, not targeting the right phrase. It's an industry term instead of the terminology that the users use or whatever. And so um, that, that sort of reporting I think is re really, really valuable and I find that most folks do, do not track that sort of metric. Another thing, uh, speaking of the internal linking structure, if you were to create a keyword to URL map so instead of going from URLs to keywords, which is what m most people do, right? So they take all their inventory of, of content and, and for each URL they determine what the major keyword theme is for that page or, you know, several keyword themes, whatever. Um, go the other way around and start with your keyword portfolio and then match pages to that. So say, um, these are all the keywords I desire to rank for, some I'm ranking for, some I'm not, and these are the top pages that would perform we think for each of these different keywords. And so let's say hotels in Bangkok is a, a term that you're targeting and you have five different pages that could correspond to, that could respond to that uh, 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 Google query. That they're reasonable enough uh, content there. So then you would uh, determine which is the best candidate to rank of those five URLs. And that's the one in your keyword to URL map. And then you would, uh, I'm, I wouldn't do footer links or sidebar links, but in some fashion you would rejig your internal linking structure so that you'd have this alternative navigation scheme that would be added uh, to your existing navigation that would reflow page rank or, or link equity uh, within your site so that on a very fluid, ongoing basis you would change this stuff out so that the anchor text used would be the keywords that you're targeting in uh, your keyword to URL map pointing to the URL that's associated with that keyword and then you would, um, 
I'm not here. Uh, and <laughs> you, you, you would then track your rankings and the performance and all that, um, see how it's doing. And if you're um, happy with the performance and you don't need as many of those links, you can uh, reflow some of that page rank elsewhere. And so you keep it very fluid and uh, change these links out and so forth. That can be really uh, powerful if you have a large scale website. Yeah. There, there's a theory running around right now too based on the May Day update that it isn't about your, your internal linking as far as hierarchy goes, it's about clicks from the home page. So you have all these, you may have two million pages, but you know 1.5 million of those might be six clicks away from the home page as far as a hierarchy. And if it's not that close to the home page, it's not, not that close to the number one page where people enter your website, then how important is it really if you've got it buried that deep for people to find? And so there's been a lot of discussion around that. And I, I, you know, I can't say for sure that I have any evidence of it, but there seems to be a lot of anecdotal evidence running around that, you know, if you're five, six clicks away from the home page, those pages aren't popping for anything anymore, which is why in the May Day update, everybody lost piles of long tail traffic. The, the closer you are to an external link source, the better. Right, so yeah, if you're one click away, that's much better than six. You you always want to be within a, any page of content that is valuable from a ranking standpoint. You want to be within two clicks of a page that has great external link support. You'll see that in directories all the time. PR bar goes blank as you go from, um, and so that's an issue. And one thing you can do that's just pretty easy little thing is take your list of keywords and just start doing site colon queries on your own site. So you're restricting Google. Google kind of show you in order what pages they feel are the best match. So even though they wouldn't show that page against the whole web, if you restrict it to just your site and you type in blue fuzzy widgets, right, Google's going to rank 10 pages from your site and show you and typically the ones that are closer to the top would be the ones you'd want to focus on as far as optimizing and bringing higher up the food chain so they get seen. Now I know everybody's going to find this hard to believe, but it's 4.30. Wow. Um, so there's a couple things. Uh, at the beginning I mentioned uh, bring up business cards, bring up questions. These are the email addresses of the panelists. Um, and we're totally okay with continuing to answer questions if you'd like to come up. Um, that is not at all a problem. Uh, some of us are giving away things. Uh, I'm giving away copies of my tools. Some of you may have white papers, there's all sorts of things uh, that are appropriate. Away pants. Yeah, I'm giving away business cards. Some of us are accepting uh, beers. Uh, there's all sorts of different things we can do. Please uh, join me in thanking the panel.